do the moss. But I love it. I love the green next to the, the bronze color. I want it to feel in the environment as if it just, uh, the earth created a sculpture and that it belongs to this family of trees here. What it really represents for me personally is this idea of feeling freed from confinement. So the trunk itself is confined to a specific spot, but yet the trees are free to grow and wander and connect with, with the environment. I went out in the woods and gathered these pieces and then incorporated them here so that it just looks like um, these mushrooms are growing out of the trunk. And here we go, some natural leaves dropping down. So I just really wanted it to be completely integrated into the environment and just look like, you know, it was born here. Working in stone, it's easy to see why it was the preferred medium of Michelangelo and the great Renaissance sculptors because it's such a dream to work with. This is a block of marble from Carrara, Italy that was just sitting in my yard. I started with the concept of a woman and she became this transformative creature morphing from human to fish to sea life of plant variety and there's a otter or some kind of a sea otter on the back side and uh, they're all sort of running into one another so that it's hard to tell where one ends and the other begins so the hope is that people will travel around it and in and out and through it and see it from all sides and take their mind on a journey This work, I was thinking about a couple things. It's been influenced by climate change and also by the way that the pandemic has affected our social interactions. Um, so the title, The Rise and Rise, is more about the climate change aspect and um, having to provide safe passage and um, access to a destination above what may be an impassable ground or surface below. I've been thinking a lot about suspension bridges and then my understanding of them changed with the pandemic and our isolation at home, wanting to have social connections but needing to stay separate. So with that, my, my understanding of suspension bridges started to be a bit more of a connection and this sort of bridge of desire to reach out and be with others even when we have to be physically separate. The whole idea was global warming. When I saw the horrific colors of all those forest fires, that's when I decided I wanted to do something about red, like wake up and it recollects the fires. And that's why I went crazy with the red. <laughs> These are like offerings. Yeah. Reminding people, like, I'm making an offering to nature. Like if we don't have all this greenery, how we would really be lost. I would be lost. That's the inspiration. They are like trees, but the way trees just form, like very random and not beautiful, you're not sure if they're on fire or kind of saying, stop the global warming, basically. Basically, my idea was to create um, a piece that will show the tension between nature and energy. So as one can see, sees the reflections, but then when you approach, you see laser cut drawings of a decommissioned power plant in Philadelphia. And on the other side, you see a power grid that will carry the electricity 
But the interesting thing also is that it has dichroic film, and then when you look at it, it changes with the light and with the movement. And I see myself reflected as part of the piece, and so I'm part of it, but then I see the nature on the other side. So you are part of the piece, but you are not at every moment, and everybody has a different view at every moment. What actually predates the recycling is really quilting, you know, putting together scraps. But I think this pattern making and, um, you know, using found materials like a, a piece of, like a scrap, um, to recreate it into something came, it was way before recycling. I mean, it is recycling, of course, but at that point it wasn't so desperate and about the environment as much. This was a several year collection and I might have had like, oh, I don't know, maybe this much. And then I put out the word, you know, to neighbors and on in liquid and, and you know, it's just enough people keep it flowing. So the title, um, Reliquary Remains, has a lot to do with the material that we used for the piece were literally remains. Um, the wood is all pulled from our carriage house uh, that we renovated in Philadelphia. And a lot of the steel is used uh, from the off cuts from custom metal working that we do. So it ended up being a lot of remaining metal that we had in our shop. And I feel like that connection of, so we were using old material that it's like we have joists that are 100 years old and I feel like um, material uh, harnesses a lot of um, just inherent power to it, like just the age of something you only get through time. And well, what felt so potent about using remains in this piece folded almost too perfectly into the idea behind the piece, which is that we are bringing up the remains of an unknown civilization. We are both using remaining material and giving it this new life and also using that to represent something that felt like the remains of other people or another society or another place. I, I feel like over the last like five years I sometimes I sit back and I, I, I don't I kind of don't recognize where I live anymore it, it, as far as what's happening it just seems like Things are happening on a big scale sometimes, and I thought, if if I could step out of where we are and how we live and what we were doing, and think about things on a bigger scale like that, and I was to put a probe anywhere, I would put a probe here now. I felt like in in a, in a way I I was remaking a sculpture that I've already done, but but when you change the scale, it changes how you feel next to it, and it, it changes even the the meaning. A fun experience <laughs> watching it literally take the weather. <laughs> this fabric is actually a sienna type and other pieces I, I made um, on land so we'll see how they all hold up. Actually the bottom piece of fabric is shibori so there's a lot of different elements within all the different practices that I do with fabric. It's now kind of literally rolled into one. <laughs> visiting the site and looking at the creek here um, and just learning a little bit about the history of the area. So most of the pieces start with a little bit of research and thinking about the time frame in which people would have lived here. 
um, in addition to the creek inspiration. It's based off of living in the city and having the sewer grate where things kind of gather. So just imagining if you had a little stopping point where objects would have co collected over the years. So items in the installation are a combination of things that would have been found in the region from the 18th to the 21st century. So you'll find things like camel sticks, mugs, liquor bottles, um, and then some things like a rubber duck. So kind of a combination of something happening now and something in the past. It's a weeping, sort of a weeping willow that is made in my foundry and I cast an open sand. So I make the mold right in the sand. If you come up close, you can actually see that you can see my fingernails. So I pressed my hands into the sand and then we ladle bronze directly into the mold. These are also my hands with energy rating at, radiating out from them. It's all cast flat. You can see up here that I, I bend them once they're cast. And then we weld all the different elements together. And I never know in the beginning exactly what it's going to look like. I did a wire study, but it has its own ideas once it starts what it wants to be. I conceived this after my father died, and my work had been very, very exuberant. Um, and I wanted this to be a little more mixed that the tree is fading, it's dying, and yet it's also putting out new growth. So this is the kind of the cycle of life. It's a, it's a unique piece, and I'm just thrilled to have this in this environment. It feels like it belongs here. So being invited by In Liquid to be included in this show was um, a real honor.